Welcome back. Now, in December 2019, a cluster of pneumonia cases from an unknown virus surfaced in Wuhan, China. The disease was named Coronavirus Disease 2019, abbreviated as COVID-19. The COVID-19 outbreak has since spread to about 196 countries and territories in every continent. While there are ongoing efforts to curtail the spread of this disease, the economic uncertainties and disruptions that have resulted from the pandemic comes at a significant cost to the global economy. Now, the United Nations Trade and Development Agency put the cost of the outbreak at about two trillion US dollars in 2020. Now, yes, we might have had financial crisis in the past, but none can be compared to the crisis resulting from COVID-19. Patrick Okedian, Oked Okay, Dinachi Utomi is a Nigerian professor of political economy and management expert. He's a fellow of the Institute of Management Consultant of Nigeria and a, fellow, a former presidential candidate. He's a founder of Center for Value in Leadership and the African Democratic Congress. He is a professor at Lagos Business School and has served in senior positions in government as an advisor to the president of Nigeria, the private sector, as chief operating officer of Volkswagen Nigeria. Now remember you can join the conversation, tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Waze Show Africa One with the hashtag Ways or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-803-84663. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Patitomi. I was trying to pronounce your middle name. <laughs> yeah, that's a test, you know. How Nigerian are you? <laughs> I'm not so much of a... <laughs> but I tried, to, I tried to get it right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, first of all, it's an honor to have you on, on, on Ways. And um, we'll just jump right into the conversation. Um, Nigeria, as we know it, has been a very, very... Would they call it one, one economy? If I don't want to use the economic term, we are, we've been dependent on oil for a very long time. And with the current crisis that has happened in um, Nigeria with the COVID-19 and people rejecting our oil, we've seen that we can't sustain that, you know, as an economy. And it's, I mean, putting the, the figures, $2 trillion to, to, we know the COVID-19 disease is quite expensive to, to curtail. How would you see this impacting our economy in Nigeria? Uh, severely. Um, we're talking about having um, oil out there and nobody's willing to buy. It's not the first time it's happened to Nigeria. And this is why it is painful that we are letting it happen to us again. In 1980, I was visiting Nigeria. I was in grad school in the US. I was visiting. And at JFK, there was a, an amazing thing. Newsweek and Time magazine both had exact same words on their cover. It never happened before that. And those words were the world over a barrel. Oil prices had gone to $40. That had not been imagined possible in those days. $40 a barrel, the world has gone upside down. I got on the plane, arrived in Lagos, and I could see the effect literally on the streets of Lagos. Um, we were drinking beer that we could not pronounce the name of. Oh, wow. That means we imported canned beer from just about any, anywhere in the world. We couldn't pronounce it. And we drank the thing. And from the buses, we tossed out the can. So Lagos was the biggest dustbin in the world. Um, you couldn't go through an, anywhere in Surulere without re-navigating and going around because everybody had a party that blocked the street. We were partying, and some people were crazy enough. They would actually buy enough champagne, pour them into a bucket to show that they were happening people. If you arrive at the party, you wash your hands in a bucket of sticky champagne. Wow. So, uh, that kind of mindlessness. Guess what? A couple of years, two years later, I'm back in the country. I'm done with graduate work. And suddenly, Nigeria can't sell. For two weeks, Nigeria could not sell one drum, one barrel of crude oil. And we were in a structural logjam. The Nigerian economy, we couldn't pay due bills. Central Bank of Nigeria, before then, it used to be that was on bills of collection. You know, you know banks just opened letters of credit and you know, central bank just paid. Central bank couldn't afford to pay these bills. It wasn't too long before we were queuing on the streets of Nigeria to buy milk, sugar. They were called essential commodities. Esenko, you would go and see a mile long queue waiting to buy sugar in this city of Lagos. Mm. I mean, to go through all of that 
and not walk your way out of that kind of scenario, nothing defines madness more to me. But we've got a leadership elite that has managed to do that. Uh, we have only one equal in the world in this kind of thinklessness. It's a country called Venezuela. Venezuela sits on the biggest deposit of crude oil in the world. And anytime oil prices go two, three dollars that way, people of Venezuela are standing on queues trying to buy sugar and milk. Oh. Um, so we, we have had it coming. And almost every budget speech that I can think of from the 80s used to have uh, objective is to diversify hmm. this economy away from the monocultural dependence on crude oil. Hmm. And absolutely nothing happens. Because it was convenient for the political class, whether they were soldiers or civilians, to just go and collect revenues and spend. You don't build an economy like that. That's what sadly we have done. Now it's come back again. Yeah, you know what I find interesting? Uh, when we saw the 2020 budget, which obviously had like 20% increase from the um, 2019 budget, and you know, now with everything that you have said about oil price and whatnot, <laughs> so the question is, why, why are we always borrowing and seeking aid? Is it like we don't see the rainy days coming or we just choose to ignore it? What exactly happens up there? Well, I, my, my characterizations have become uh, more uh, aggravated with the years uh, because there's something that's happened to Nigeria and we all refused and all of us, including both of you and myself, are partly responsible. We've abdicated from our citizenship role. Oh. <laughs> you know, when, when we were undergraduates at the University of Nigeria back in the very early 70s, I mean, Anytime anything happened that we did not like, I mean, it might still be ongoing and we were on the streets. We wouldn't accept this. But we now have, we have you, we have the millennials who just get on Twitter and insult everybody and do absolutely nothing about anything. Prof, I, are you sure about that? Because I, I beg to disagree. Because <laughs> okay. yesterday, yes. when the burial rights of... Um, What's his name? Uh, the late Abakari okay. happened, hmm. and we saw the videos of some of the officials. I mean, taking off their gears and all. It was Twitter that eventually made them to go and realize certain things. Social media. We, we might be on social media, but I think slowly we are also passing that message. Yeah, I but, wouldn't say it's completely okay inefficient. Okay, I, I'm not saying it's inefficient. I'm just saying that it's inoculating a manner of speaking. Okay, you don't become involved. Um. Do you know, public conversation 30, 40 years ago, 40 something years ago when I was in university in this country, the average undergraduate is so educated. He will quote you from Franz Fanon and all those people, and they are involved in wanting to get to the heart of this problem. Today, I don't know, something that I promoted for a long time, the, the culture sector. I don't know why it's because the culture sector is not doing so well with the music and all of that. Mm. People seem to be more like, uh, hey, the world is a party. Well, the world is more than a party. We have not managed to build a country. We have not built an economy. And so any small shaking, we're falling apart. So is this not coming from the mindset that, you know, everything that is foreign is good and what is like local is substandard? And this mindset strongly has been filled by the elites that you're talking about. Because it's not from the grassroots. The, the elites would, I mean, recently we had the House of Representatives uh, buying up cars. It was a Toyota Camry. We have an Worth innocent, over you know, million. we have an innocent motors in Nigeria. No, it, so where it, is this feeling from? Because it, it's more fundamental it, than that. Why should we have a National Assembly that's spending that kind of money when a country is literally running into bankruptcy? Doesn't make any sense to me. Just does not make any sense to me. Look, uh, politicians, and I use Nigerian, non Nigerian, African examples. I, I give an example in an interview I just gave uh, back in the 60s. The average university professor earned higher than any member of parliament in Nigeria. Mm. Professor 
Elibute, uh, one of the early professors of medicine at Unilag, made the point a couple of times at meetings we had a couple of years ago before he passed on. And the day he was appointed professor of medicine, his salary was higher than that of the prime minister of Nigeria. But what values have changed in Nigeria? The cost of government, we can't, rational, we can't justify it in any shape, manner, whether it's the executive branch or the legislative branch. So this is money that we should be investing in creating the infrastructure that will facilitate growth. This is money we could be using in so many different ways. Uh, politicians, I give an, another example, Onyeko Onwenu makes the point that her father was a member of parliament. She was growing up and he was a, a school principal in Port Harcourt. He rode around in his bicycle, borrowed money from her mother, who was a trader, but he was an MP. Now, MPs were in a citizen legislature, as it's called. It, means it was not a full-time job. You took a few days, a month or whatever, to go and make laws, and you return to your normal business. Now we spend a fortune maintaining a political class that's contributing very little to building our country. That's part of the tragedy. And they don't even think that their business is about thinking to solve problems. It's really about me, myself, and I. What can I get off this system? It's a system of plunder. So I don't think we should be surprised that 30 years after annual repetition of diversifying the base of the economy, we've gone nowhere. You know? And, and it's a real crisis. Hopefully, this can become opportunity if we can think differently this time. But we've had so many of these kinds of opportunity. And once things change a little bit, oil prices go up a little. We forget it completely. Yeah. Yeah. Go back to base. So, yeah, um, a lot. you said something about building culture. And I have to agree that right now, culture, entertainment, music, arts, it is booming, especially for Nigeria. And also, now, a lot of youth, typically, including social media, it's, a lot of people are making money from it as well. Sure. So the average youth or millennial believes that entertainment, agriculture, and forex trading is the way forward for Nigerian economy. What would you say about that? I think they're right in many ways. Like I said, <clears throat> for many years, I kept talking about how culture was a, an area of comparative advantage for us, and that we could package culture. And we've not even begun to scratch what we could do with culture if we do it right. In the very early days of Nollywood, I used to organize special seminars free of charge for Nollywood people, just to make them understand this is a business. That's you can true. build I it as a business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I used to do it because I thought it was my duty to help this sector of the economy rise. With no help from government, the thing took off. Well, when government then wanted to do something, they actually appointed me chair of a, a committee when um, uh, uh, Mweke, Frank Mweke was Minister of uh, Information, appointed me chair of a committee um, to look at how they could fund Nollywood and all of that. I still don't know what happened to our report, by the way. But, you know, I knew, I saw long before the currency. I mean, Chris Obirapo, who did the very first of this series, I think, Living in Bondage thing, I spent a lot of time with him talking about uh, the possibilities of this industry. So that is territory we should advance. The one we have really not done what we should do in, and is the base, is agriculture. And we shouldn't just talk about agriculture as, you know, there's a way you talk about agriculture. It sounds esoteric, it sounds ancient, it sounds agribusiness. Agriculture is business. First of all, I don't think that we will go very far until we realize that we have some endowments. If we take our factor endowments and then develop the value chains to compete globally on those endowments, don't just go agriculture, agriculture, we are doing... No, let's take it. No, let's just take, for argument's sake, let's take cassava. You know, we, we produce more cassava than any other country in the world, by the way. Absolutely. Well, we chop the whole thing and we, we pound it in and, of and eat it. <laughs> 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 but you know how much money Indonesia, Thailand, and co are making up the tapioca and that our value chain? Ethanol. Yeah. Ethanol, starch, and this and this and that. Now, Somebody raised the issue once, I think General Bassanger was president at the time. He got very excited and said, yeah, I'm 
The future is in cassava. In the cassava cassava all got excited. <laughs> they all went and started planting. Nobody bought the thing. The next year, they all abandoned it. We've got to be more systematic. You see, you go to areas that have endowments, even the education system, tweak it. So your people in primary school, in secondary school, your education is focused on the agri value chain. You do all of those things, and you see so many businesses starting. These young boys are agents for aggregation of that produce. That's their business. They just go to small farmers, organize them. They're making money. They're looking good. They're driving fancy cars, if that's what gives them pleasure. Ah, oh, what I got? Oh, he's an aggregate agent. Ah, me too, I would like to be one. We need to do that and just take it to the whole value chain and we dominate a global value chain. Um, I think that right now, we need champions for certain things. OK, cassava, this value chain. Who is this guy who is most passionate about cassava? Hey, my friend, you are agri value chain champion. What do you need to make us the biggest in the world in this area? You meet this target, this is your benefit. You meet that target. Economics is about incentives. It sounds so, so nice the way you're putting it, Prof. But I've seen cases of where people that have the passion because they do not have the connection are unable to meet this this um, what what you're saying so a lot of people are there they have the passion to build this economy because personally we are farmers right and in fact I can tell you for free where we have our farmlands we see a lot of Asians that's Chinese people coming to buy hectares thousands of hectares of land now the government you would approach the government the government will treat you like a second-class citizen a foreigner comes to the government and the government will open their arms and give them all the properties because there are videos surfacing online saying that china is buying up the whole of europe and you africa. know some parts africa. of africa and africa as mm -hmm. well and we are seeing this that it is actually happening in in our time so how do we get i mean is it that our government do not have the willpower to drive this economy or what kind of things do we need to do but i think we would have to go on a break okay then you will come back we'll come back and you answer that question for me we'll see you after the break please stay with us